It's been very interesting sitting listening this morning because everything I've heard so far resonates with me and it really kind of reconfirms the decisions that we've made, BDP's made as a business over the last five years and the actions that we've taken and we're continuing to take. Um, what I would say at the very beginning though is um, that for me, for us, isn't necessarily about level two, isn't necessarily about, about the government mandate. It's about the logical evolution of the way that we develop and deliver information, the way that we design, and the way that we can do that better, more efficiently. Um, and I want to start here, autumn 2010. This is important, and as an architect, I kind of help start talking about myself. But what was important was that I was put in the role I'm in now, then. I'm an architect. I still believe I'm an architect. Um, I worked for BDP up in our Glasgow office for 13 years before taking up the role I'm in now. And my experience was delivering large-scale retail projects. So I knew what it was to design and deliver and to hopefully do that efficiently, profitably and successfully. Um, I was asked to come down to Manchester from Glasgow to lead our IT side because they were spending far too much money on stuff that they wanted to play with and wasn't giving value to the business, so it wasn't giving value to our clients. But luckily, that broadly coincided with the, with the bit mandate. I arrived and I thought, well, what are we going to do? I'm an architect. I don't understand how any of this works, but I know how we build buildings. I know what we need to make us better. So I looked at our infrastructure, um, the way that the IT was hung together, um, the way we project management, the way we manage projects, the way we designed and the way we financially manage the business and where could I take this because a lot of that I didn't understand. Well it was clear and this actually follows our BIM journey because if this isn't right none of it's going to work but we need a, a more robust and resilient infrastructure to which everybody was then working within. At the heart of that was project design and delivery, what we did day to day. Project management, the way we controlled and delivered that information, and financial management, the way we effectively managed and resourced projects, the way, and the way we effectively managed and resourced the business. So these were the four cornerstones of what we, the journey we set out on five years ago. What we've done now, and I don't mention many products, um, infrastructure is an ongoing development we spend over 5% of turnover annually on all of IT software and hardware provisions. But it never stops. And the problem is, as hardware gets more sophisticated, as software gets more sophisticated, that framework, that backbone has to continually be developed to, to keep pace. Um, at heart, project design and delivery is BIM, centred around the Revit platform. Those of you that understand BDP's history will understand how contentious that might actually be. Um, new forma for project management and Delta vision for financial management. But the key thing, and this is what I've taken out of certainly the last three presentations, is a people design and <coughs> process driven strategy. It's knitting all of that together. So what drove our adoption? Well, the recession as a large architecture and engineering practice um, when I took over, the workload was reducing, staff numbers were unfortunately reducing as well. And we needed to find ways of being more efficient, of doing, I'm going to say more for less, although people may disagree with me with that, but we needed to find more efficient ways of working. The hardware and the software was improving to the point that we could actually do more um, because of the scale of building that we did. Um, emerging contractor demand. and this actually began to drive us forward before the mandate did. But contractors were coming to us and saying, we want you to work in, in with us, for us, against us at times. Um, and then the government mandate. Now, for me, what the mandate's actually done, far more powerfully than the level two part of it, it's focused everybody, it's certainly focused us on driving a technological change forward within our business. The level two component is, for us, about a more consistent, uniform, repeatable approach, a more meaningful collaboration. But what the mandate has done is said, you will use BIM. So moving from 2D working, 
through into 3D and more, more complex data manipulation. And BIM, for many in, in our business, was considered the silver bullet. It'll solve everything. It'll make us more profitable, more efficient. It will win us more work. And some of that is true. When I get to the very end, I'll give you some figures about what BIM is meaning for us now. Um, why is it important to us? Well, prerequisite now for winning work. Um, it provides design efficiencies and construction opportunities. It gives a more consistent product. That reduces risk. That reduces error. That reduces litigation. That makes us more profitable. So this was what we were doing pre-2011. This is the structural model for the Bridge Academy. And that's the building finished. So we were working. We understood the benefit it could give us. But it was very small. Then spring 2011 disappeared. Timeline. We all like timelines. But the, the mandate appeared with this statement. And this is a statement that I took and I, under, I, well, I felt I understood at that point. Um, and we were told BIM adoption starts small. The only way it's going to work, the only way the software really works is for small scale projects, 10, 15, 20 million pounds. You know, maybe do a, a primary school, that kind of thing. But we had a contractor buying on our door. If you want to work with us, you will work within BIM. So, Start small. This is our first BIM project, first architectural BIM project. Now, unfortunately, this, this project has waxed and waned as the recession came through, changes in government, but it's back on track now. But what this showed us was not so much three-dimensional geometry, but what you can see here is the complexity that we can start to build within individual spaces, capturing data, linking information from external databases into a model. Um, and from that, we can produce this level of information quickly. And at this stage, this was probably scheme design. But plan section, elevation, reflected ceiling plan, and equipment schedules on a room by room basis, scheduling information that, that has been briefed, allowing us to confirm against brief, check against brief, hugely important. And what this did was get us on the journey because our healthcare teams. And at this point, we had three or four significant projects in the business, discovered that they couldn't actually work efficiently any other way. So 2011, what were we, what were we doing? Well, we were trying to understand what the mandate was and what it meant. Um, we set out an internal BIM policy targeting 2015. Um, and we were targeting 75% of workload by 2015 being delivered through BIM. We were looking at training and support, and what we said was, each of our core professions in each location, find one project, maybe a team of two or three people, but find one project each and start to move that forward. Understand what it means, understand what works, what doesn't work, and begin to build knowledge and capacity. Um, and say, so healthcare and the BIM-specific workflows were allowing us to be, effectively, to do what we couldn't have done without it. We then move on, 2012, trial and error, beginning to see what's happening. And at this point, when it comes back to some of the, the, earlier, um, the earlier discussions, it was about education because what we were trying to do was build capacity, start new projects, but the project runners were being tasked to deliver more with teams needing to be trained without program flexing, without profitability necessarily reflecting that and there will be a drop in, perf in performance. So we had that, that, the, the, those challenges to overcome. Uh, the documents are starting to come thick, thick and fast now. Uh, the task group was, uh, was put in place, and the RIBA um, produced the, the, the BIM overlay to the old plan of work. Again, as an architect, I focus on what architects do. And our journey really has been about architecture and engineering. But it's similar themes, similar messages. And this is a typical, typical example of what we were beginning to do. This is a relatively small scale school. The architecture and interior design and fixed furniture and equipment was delivered from our, Manchester, our Sheffield office. The civil, structural, and MEP was delivered from our um, Sheffield office. So ground slab, <laughs> building up through structural frames, slabs, primary services, FF&E, secondary steel architecture, but we built it. Now, this team trained themselves, um, and once they'd been through the process working within the software, they refused to go back. It was the first project that, that 
the officers had been doing and the, these groups had been doing, but they saw the benefit. And it was beginning to build confidence on a smaller scale to begin with, but it then grows and grows and grows. And that's the, that was the important part for us. Because if you remember, as we came into this year, we were at 8% adoption. Um, by the end of 2012, we're up to 15% of ad adoption. So 15% of our technical staff that we'd expect to be using CAD or BIM software were using BIM tools. Um, interdisciplinary projects were now being progressed, and we were looking at multi-site issues. Now, those of you that are trying to do this on the ground will understand what I mean when I say the software does not work well from bet between offices. The idea of a shared model and collaborative modeling doesn't work. But what we did find was that by applying the PSL 92 process, we could transfer information around and we could begin to overcome these issues. And we were building BIM awareness amongst middle management and that's the group to target. The board directors understood they had to do this. They were reading in the press. They were looking at how the business could be more efficient. So they were sold. They said, go on, make it happen. The guys at the very bottom, the software users, were seeing the benefit that it was giving to them. They could do more and more efficiently. Now, you ask somebody that spent three months working on a door schedule for a shopping, a, a, a shopping complex to do it in BIM, they don't want to do it any other way. So they, they saw it. But again, it's the job runners the managers that were, were important. And we looked at uh, developing our own BDP BIM standard for the software of choice for us and BIM execution plans to begin to address what was happening within the mandate. Uh, so 2013, moving on, building support. Standards still keep coming, still keep coming. Um, we looked at content, content management and how can we drive efficiency? Well, a centralized content library for our UK offices begin to build content, push it out, everyone uses the same stuff, it's vetted, it's approved, it's checked, it's uniform. It reduces each project building their own. And I, I know, having worked on three or four similar projects, you'll find members of the team that have drawn doors, drawn block work, drawn, drawn roofs over a 10-year period, reinventing, redoing rebuilding, same details, no need for it. This allows us to get that consistency. Um, this was probably one of our key project that, projects at that point, Alderhey Children's Hospital. And what I'm showing here is Shell and Core, it's a top model, developed from Manchester. The departmental layouts, which is a middle model, developed from our London office, and then fixed furniture and equipment, um, which was developed in Sheffield as the bottom. Now, in reality, that was 28 different models brought together. But it begins to show the capacity that we have and the, 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 the level that, that we could go into. Um, again, just moving into the, the FFE linking again. And for us, this management of data uh, gives us great, great power. Um, what we're then looking at doing is, and for me, it's one of the areas that's beginning to get lost within within the level two mandate. It's about communication. Now we talk about data, we talk about moving data, but it's about communication. And if you turn up to brief a group of users, doctors and nurses, um, they don't necessarily understand spreadsheets. They don't actually necessarily, under necessarily understand plan sections and elevations. But three-dimensional representations, which are an outcome of the modeling process rather than a presentation tool in itself becomes far more valuable. But then linking that back to specific equipment. And this just begins to give us an, give us an extra edge, give us a little bit more power. We also were working with um, a particular contractor to look at how we could streamline manufacturing processes and understand what we were doing within the model and pass that information across the use. Now, we've taken this particular workflow and applied it on successive projects, and we're also looking at other processes that we can do the same with, but it's simple incremental steps. And one of the things within our whole built BIM journey is that it's not something you're ever going to achieve overnight or within a month or within six months or within a year. You know, we've been at it five years, and we're just beginning to understand where we should be going. But you build and you build and you build slowly 
manage, uh, in manageable ways, you find the benefit, you deliver the benefit, you move on to the next, next stage. So here, you know, off-site manufacture, improved quality, improved health and safety, improved site, site logistics, but all part of the BIM, BIM benefit. Uh, this project now opened to great acclaim. I can't remember whether it was last year or earlier this year. But again, what I want to show is it's not the fact that we have pilot projects. We're working over a number of years and delivering now through, through these methodologies. So by the end of 2013, we're up to 27% adoption. Um, we're consolidating our, 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 our strategies. We're looking at what level two actually means and what the standards mean now that they are beginning to be published. Incremental improvements in skills and adoption and the practice-wide content library. Um, so 2014, we're beginning to get serious. Um, the standards are almost all there and you can see there's an awful lot to get hold of. Um, we decided that we had to mandate a recruitment policy across the business. And this is where I come back to what, what my colleagues were talking about earlier. What we realized was we were bringing people in without relevant skills. So we were bringing people in in an inefficient way that we then had to pay to train. Pay for trainers, pay for non-productive time, and it was, an, it was an issue for us. Equally, we realized that individuals within the business that we had developed and put in these particular roles with the skills were leaving and going elsewhere because we made them more marketable. We had to address both sides of this. So what, what we did first of all was have a retention policy based around BIM competency and software competency. Then we developed a recruitment policy which said that before the offer of employment, you will, tr you will test through industry standard tools to understand whether people have the skills or not. If they don't, it doesn't mean that you don't employ them, but you understand that the first couple of weeks of them coming into the business, they have to be set aside from projects to be trained. They will then be put through the, the assessment process again, and once they've achieved an industry standard score, we will put the software on their machines and you can deploy them on projects. Now, the failing here that we recognize is that this is about software, it's not about process, but it helps us build capacity. Um, we use, say, this is, I'll just quickly go through because I'm running out of time. We also moved from a, tr from a trainer based approach and classroom based training, which we were beginning to find too costly for the volumes that we were looking to train to online. Now, this meant that we could very quickly give training material to anybody rather than spending six weeks trying to coordinate eight people to get in a room for two days. But the other thing is it allows people to train themselves in their time, not necessarily during normal business hours. Um, this was seen as a benefit by middle management because people were still active and were still fearing um, during normal working hours and, and could train in their own time. We also looked at our process. Uh, the BDP process was realigned to address PAS 1192, RIVA plan of work and the, the well-recognised work stages that are, that are now part of the mandate. And we moved forward with um, business certification. I met BRA, I met Paul Oakley at BIM Show Live in, in 2014 and I was interested to hear about the BRE business systems certification scheme for level two companies. Equally, I was very nervous about op opening ourselves up to external scrutiny because we could have been found to have done it all wrong. Um, given the investment that we'd made, it was important that we understood that where we were on the right track, but it was a risk. Where we are now, all UK and, I and Irish offices are certified as level two compliant for our business processes. That doesn't mean every project we are doing is delivering level two BIM because that isn't within our control, but we can be part of that process. Um, the way the assessment worked, interestingly enough, kind of follows our strategy. It looked at, it looked at our infrastructure, made sure it was suitable, looked at our user hardware, made sure that we had a, a proper man managed process 
then it to processes staff <laughs> training software, the way we were applying them, and then finally looked at projects. And for me, you know, it's not simply about the software. It's not simply about a Kobe spreadsheet. It, it's, a, it's a far more holistic approach that's needed to make it work. So we were then moving on. This is a further project that we were doing. I know I'm running out of time. This image for me also is important because it shows the way that we are moving past an individual building and it's looking at site and it's you know, bringing in a more sustainable approach as well that can be supported through the process. Um, so by the end of 2014, we're at 46% adoption. Um, we've, got, we've got our level two certifications um, progressed. We've got documentation internally that reflects the standards. Recruitment and training is moving on well, and we've realigned our, our internal processes. What I felt that we had, there's a huge amount still to do. Um, 2015 building capacity. And by the end of 2015, the standards are pretty much all there. So we know what the targets are. The problem I have is, as the timeline shows, these standards have been emerging since 2007. And they all reference one another. For me, what's important now is pause for breath and ensure that everything aligns with everything else in a way that I know it doesn't quite yet. Um, we entered into uh, an enterprise business agreement with Autodesk. Um, some people may say I sold myself to the devil. A couple of them in the room somewhere. But what this did was unlock the shackles of concurrent licensing for us. It meant anybody could get access to Portfolio, Autodesk portfolio at any point. So we weren't bumping up against problems and it was just running from this point forward. There are other benefits that this has given us, but the licensing. Um, and from a business perspective, the need not to be looking to spend chunks of money every two to three months and, 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 and adding licenses really unlocked a great deal for us. Um, the BIM toolkit, we were involved in this, um, developing the level of detail standard. But this just helps us better understand what we should be applying and how we should be applying it. And I talked about visualization. One of the most powerful things that we've actually done, I felt, when we started out, was a bit of fluff, a, a, bit, of, a bit of an interlude. But virtual reality and what we can now do very quickly with the models that we're creating is turning into such a powerful tool because we can put users in the building that we're designing for them and they can see round about it, they can navigate through it in a way that allows them to understand what's being sold. I know that certainly some, some of the work I've read on the Ministry of Justice, this type of thing is seen as really beneficial to brief, to understand the way spaces work, what actually might not work. I've got a couple of examples. If anybody wants to catch me at lunch, I'll let you see. But this little image here was from a user group meeting um, for a hospital. And there's a video on YouTube uh, and the reaction from the nurse seeing the space. You know, it says it all. And this, you know, this for us is as powerful as anything else. Computational design. Um, everybody tells you the software does everything you need. Well, it does until you realise what you want to do and the software can't do it. Um, we put uh, three groups across the business through um, a week-long workshop in computational design to allow them to link um, one particular product with another particular product to tailor it in a way for us to solve problems that we had. So those of you that are working within, within Revit will understand trying to use a simple model for energy, energy analysis is extremely difficult. We were able to come up with the workflow you see, which, which through a couple of steps allows that to happen. So all of a sudden, analysis becomes far easier to achieve. Um, and again, you know, we're still doing it. This is Cardiff and Vale College, it's a little short of the model, and this opened towards the end of last year. So end of, end of 2015, uh, everything I've been through before, and we're at 68% adoption. Now, we'd only have achieved that with the, the help of Autodesk and with the software being available. Um, very quickly, what are we doing next? Looking at what we've done before and reappraising it all. So confident complexity, we're, we're building, increasingly building on skills. 
we're looking at checking and verification of the work that we're doing, making sure that what we're doing is robust initially in data terms and is achieving the deliverables that we'd set for us. We're, look, we're monitoring usage and we're understanding where training can be targeted to use. We're looking at staff certification. So I talked about software training at a basic level. What we're doing now is working with BRE to build a practice-wide knowledge about level two thin processes. We've also agreed with Autodesk to set, to set ourselves up as an external training resource. And we are looking to put 100 staff through their Revit prof professional certification scheme in the next 12 months and to continue to do that, to build more competent capacity and also support the way um, our certification processes have to continue. But we're looking to address both job runners and software users at the same time. We're looking at mobility, looking at Citrix and the way that we can more effectively and meaningfully, coll meaningfully collaborate. Um, but has been benefited BDP? Well, it's difficult to say. Um, there are so many different factors that affect the profitability of a project and therefore the profitability of a business. And over the last five years, the environment that we've been trying to apply this to has been constantly changing. So there is no baseline. But between 2014 and 2015, and these figures are actually November 2014 and November 2015, between that 12 month period, our staff line increased by 7%. Our turnover increased by 24%. Our BIM adoption increased by 45%. And the time that increased number of people used the tools for increased by 77%. So I can't tell you whether it's made us any more profitable or not. What I can tell you is by increasing adoption, we, are do, we, are, we have increased turnover without an equivalent turnover in staff. And the point for me is we actually now need to reach the point where BIM is the standard way of, of design development and delivery. With all of our partners, because we are a small part of the process, and BIM is not a singular process. It means many different things to many different people at various points through the, the life of a building from inception through to demolition. But it has to be seen as the way we do things now and moving forward. And that's all.